For Major John Lephart, the pilot, and Captain Joseph Bernholtz, the navigator, it was routine. They'd done this many times. When their fully loaded F-4 roared down the runway at 1 p.m. that day, they climbed to 4,500 feet and completed their target run. Heading back to base at around 1.30 p.m., a master caution light flashed, indicating a hydraulic system failure. They both noticed a six-inch hole in the right wing, so they notified ground control. Although it seemed serious, Major Lephart began positioning the aircraft for a hard landing, with the hook down and the barrier engaged on the runway. At AFTN Udorn, four men were on duty manning the radio and television station. Tech Sergeant Jack Hawley, Staff Sergeant James Howard, Staff Sergeant Alfred Potter, and Airman First Class, Andrew McCartney, were all focused on their jobs, and any unusual noises outside went unnoticed. In the air, the F-4 lost all hydraulic control, and the pilot and co-pilot decided to eject from the aircraft. Already low over the base and shaking from the lack of control, the jet slammed down through the front door of the station, instantly killing the men inside. The entire area around the station became hell on earth as nine total buildings were destroyed. And a total of nine men lost their lives. My name is Dick Heiner. I was an Air Force captain, and I was a deputy chief of the uh, American Forces Thailand Network from 1969 until 1970. The most horrendous experience that I'll never forget was the day that the uh, F-4 crashed into the station at Udorn. Um, that was uh, uh, certainly an unforgettable experience. Um, I was sitting at my desk um, I just had lunch and uh, Sergeant Ushold, who was the network superintendent, uh, came in and said, I had a call from uh, Master Sergeant Lynch from Dorn, and something terrible has happened. So I picked up the phone and uh, it was uh, Jack Lynch uh, who said that an uh, airplane had flown through the front door of the uh, station at Udorn and it was totally uh, in flames and he had no idea uh, who was in there at the time. He had a pretty good idea, but he didn't know exactly who was there or who had gotten out, and he didn't know who was off duty uh, and who had gone to run an errand or something like that. And he would call me back as soon as he discovered uh, who, uh, what the, what the uh, extent of the casualties were. Um, Sergeant Ushold and I got together at that time, and uh, uh, I called uh, 13th Air Force uh, uh, Chief Master Sergeant Bradley over 13th Air Force and informed him. Uh, Bradley is uh, a guy who recorded all of the telephone conversations that uh, he got at uh, 13th Air Force and he still, I think he had the tape, I don't know what he did with it, but uh, he was not aware that this had happened. Uh, and then uh, we called in uh, our people and put the, put the staff together. Uh, T.J. Davis, uh, uh, Sergeant T.J. Davis was uh, on our staff and uh, he went out and came back and indicated that uh, he had found an airplane. 
uh, for us to go up and pick up the survivors and also to go to Cock Lee to pick up a radio transmitter to take to Udorn to try to get back on the air because Sergeant Usher and I felt that it was mandatory for everybody's uh, uh, psychological uh, uh, health to get that station on the air just as soon as possible, get it back on the air. And so uh, Davis showed up with a C-47 out at the flight line. It had no markings on it. The pilots were in civilian clothes, and I asked TJ, I said, where'd you get this airplane? He said, don't ask. Uh, so I didn't. Uh, and that airplane uh, was our, at our disposal for almost a week. Uh, it not only ferried equipment around and brought the survivors down uh, uh, from uh, Udorn, but also uh, uh, transported us to Udorn for the uh, uh, memorial service that we had uh, a couple of days later. Uh, we brought the survivors down after we determined who had not been in the building and uh, we set up uh, a studio in the Karat Studios, a radio studio, for them to operate uh, out of uh, Karat uh, to provide, continue to provide service to the dorm. Of course the transmitter we had installed up there uh, after the tragedy and they were on the air within 24 hours uh, transmitting from uh, uh, their, their radio programs from, uh, from Karat. And so uh, that was probably the most memorable experience that I had. I think for the broadcasters, um, for one, I think that had we just let them sit in their barracks for uh, several days uh, and think about what happened and to think about this could have been me, uh, that certainly wasn't healthy for them to do that. Uh, so we wanted to get them down, keep them busy. And the remarkable thing about those, uh, those uh, broadcasters that came down was the fact that they went on the air and they were absolutely, totally professional. Uh, they acted as if nothing had happened, uh, that it was just any other day. And that I'll never forget. Uh, so one of the things that, that, that how it affected me was uh, I had planned to get out of the uh, Air Force uh, at the end of my tour. That would have only been like six weeks. Um, after that happened and uh, I was going back to the University of Oklahoma to get a PhD uh, and I had my papers in and I decided to pull them and stay in the Air Force because of the fact that I just can't leave uh, these, these people uh, and I mean just just absolutely magnificent and so uh, I stayed in as a result of that, uh, of that tragedy. Uh, it was obviously a very sad occasion. Um, it was held in the chapel at Udor. Uh, there were a number of people that came, uh, very high-ranking uh, uh, people. There were some general officers there. Uh, of course, we all came up from Karat uh, to, uh, uh, to experience it. Uh, but on the other hand, it was like a celebration of uh, their lives and their dedication of those people that, uh, that, that had died in the, uh, in, in the crash. Uh, and so it was uh, sort of closure for, uh, for a number of us to, to have been there. Uh, it wasn't enough for us to do because we always, we always felt a little empty about, we wish, we wish there had been something we could have done to, to have prevented this. But honoring those, those, those guys that, that gave their lives was, uh, was uh, provided some closure for us and uh, made us feel a little better. But the memories, of course, will last forever. Uh, every April 10th, I go back to the Vietnam Memorial Wall uh, and, uh, and, and visit them. So that's something I, I look forward to. Those of us from the broadcast industry or who went through DINFOS knew that we were likely to be sent to Southeast Asia. So hearing that the destination was Thailand brought a sigh of relief. What we didn't know was the mission of the Eastern Thai bases. Overall, it was pretty simple. Fly around and take pictures at night, then feed that information to the F-4 pilots so they could fly over and bomb the daylights out of the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos during the day. Because we were so close to Laos, the sorties didn't take long. That meant that, for the most part, only the pilots were in harm's way and everything else on base was meant to support that mission. So except for an occasional foray into the Thai air bases, the VC were mostly in Laos and Cambodia. And make no mistake, being part of AFRTS was terrific duty. 
The routine at all radio and TV stations was pretty much the same at all bases in Thailand. Do a radio show, switch the film chain, and do the news, which was all rip and read from the APUPI wires. Our mission was to inform and entertain, and it was great duty. So on April 10 of 1970, the guys working at the station in Udorn were going about their work as usual. Otis Redding was on the radio, and the TV crew was prepping for the evening newscast. The men at the Udorn radio and TV station that day could hear the roar of the F-4s as they lifted off midday for their sorties over enemy territory. They probably no longer paid attention because it was so routine. But that day was unlike any other. The explosion and fire tore through eight adjoining buildings, some of which were barracks. Buildings were completely destroyed and the TV station was virtually gone. The fire burned for hours, and miraculously, the death toll was just nine men. Many men were injured from the fire, both from the explosion and for the firefighters.
So even though the war seemed far away, the fact was that even there, they were part of the war zone, and its impact came home in deadly fashion. In spite of the total loss of the station, AFTN came through with equipment to get things back on the air. Now, 50 years later, we can all look back and reflect, regardless of which base we were stationed.
Today, 50 years later, we remember the U-Door 9. Tech Sergeant Roy Walker, Staff Sergeant James A. Howard, Sergeant John C. Rose, Airman First Class Andrew C. McCartney, Staff Sergeant Edward W. Strain, Airman First Class Thomas L. Waterman. Tech Sergeant Frank D. Ryan Staff Sergeant Alfred N. Potter Tech Sergeant Jack A. Hawley